Hello and welcome to another episode of the Mark Moss Show, where we talk about each and every week, we talk about what I call the decentralized revolution. I'm talking about the way the world is changing right now before our very eyes. We look at it through the lens of politics, finance, and technology. Now, most people understand that things are changing. Um, most people don't understand why they're changing, and more importantly, where they change to or where things go. And so we try to uncover that. I know, um, you know, I've talked about this a lot. I'm not going to go through it, but um, like this pendulum that swings from centralization, which is peak centralization, World Economic Forum and UN and IMF and so forth, swinging back towards a world of decentralization. And a lot of people always ask me, um, Ark, when? When? When will this happen? And I say it's a process. It's not an event. It's happening. And so uh, we spend time looking at that, of course, um, through the lens of those three things. Like I said, politics, finance, and technology. It's easy to see that the political system around the world is changing. We'll talk about that. It's easy to see that the financial system is falling apart. It's crumbling right before our very eyes. And of course, technology is what always drives the change. And of course, we're talking about Bitcoin and the decentralized technology that provides us, which gives us exactly what we need. <laughs> right when the world needs to reject centralization to move to decentralization, we have the technology that gives us just that. So I want to talk about uh, for this show some of the biggest signposts that we can see right now today that are happening. Um, that really illustrate that we are in the middle of this process. So the event, it's a process, not an event, an event. I mean, it, 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 it doesn't happen at a specific date and time. It's happening. It's like watching paint dry um, or water boil. Um, the water is heating up and it will eventually start boiling. But right now it's just heating up and that's kind of what we're talking about. So we look at the signpost to see that these are happening. So I want to go through those and then I want to talk about what I might see as potentially the biggest opportunity that we have to take advantage of this, if we want to make money from it, um, if we want to protect our money from it, if we want to build, grow, and protect, I like to say, build, grow, and protect our wealth as this transition happens. So it's not just a matter of uh, watching uh, paint dry just to watch paint dry. It's a matter of watching this so we can move, react, we can build, grow, protect our wealth, um, and have a lot more success. I know things are scary. I get it. Uncertainty is always scary. Also, things are scary because, you know, maybe you're not happy with the way things are going, which a lot of people aren't. But it's not a not a doom and gloom show. I have lots of hope. I believe that on the other side of change is massive hope and prosperity for ourselves, for our, kid, our kids, our children, our grandkids, etc. And so that's what I'm excited about. And so let's take a look at this, um, kind of digging into this a little bit. So where do I even start? There's so many signposts that are happening. What we can see is, uh, let's, let's take a look at, uh, let's start with some of the smaller ones and we'll dig into some of the bigger ones here. Um, man, they're all so big. I've I written down like five or six big signposts. One, as I said, we've been moving towards this um, centralization. So uh, World Economic Forum, Think Tank, they're sitting above, and really, um, if we if we looked at this uh, the world sort of like an org chart, like an organizational chart for a business. Uh, if you looked at an org chart for a business, you'd have the CEO at the top, and then maybe the directors, you know, uh, the vice presidents uh, below them. Um, then you might have the managers, you know, and then like the employees. And so you kind of have this org chart, like this upside down or more like a pyramid. And if you looked at the world, we'd have something very similar, where we'd have the BIS at the top. Maybe the BIS and the IMF, the banks, the banksters that run the world. Um, they sit at the top. And then below that, then we have uh, like these policy makers like the World Economic Forum, the Rockefeller Foundation, et cetera. Um, below that, then you would have the policy uh, enforcers. These are the governments. Um, and then somewhere below that, you would have then... Um, us, the subjects, the people, right? And so um, as this power has been getting centralized, um, it's tried to basically control every area, every area of our life. One of the big ways they do that is, like I said, through the money. So it starts at the bank. So they say, hey, um, IMF says, hey, countries, if you want our money, then you must do the things that we want you to do. So for example, um, during, during the pandemic, we saw 
the entire world shut down at the exact same time, directed by uh, the sister arm of the World Economic Forum, but this is the World Health Organization, WEF, WHO. And they said, hey, the world, uh, the whole world's going to die, and so you better lock down your country. And uh, Oh, they said, the whole world's going to die. You're going to lose everything, but don't worry. We got your back. We got your back. Uh, we're going to give you a bunch of money so you don't die. And uh, in order for you to get that money, you must do the things that we say that you do. And they do that. And, and there's other ways that they do that. And so at a little bit lower level, we have this policy called ESG. I've talked about this quite extensively. It stands for um, Environmental, Social, and Governance, ESG. And it's a set of guidelines that they, uh, they being the World Economic Forum and all the people that are at the top of this pyramid, are pushing onto businesses. And again, through the money, right? So it starts at the banking. If you want our money... You must do what we say. You must um, have your businesses comply with an ESG, Environmental Social Governance, system. Now, this is, not, this is not conspiracy. This is not speculation. This is their stated goal. You can go to the World Economic Forum website. You can read it directly. Mark Carney, who's arguably one of the most influential people in the entire world. Um, if you don't know who he is, just uh, Google it real quick. You'll find out who he is. Uh, he said that companies that do not comply to these ESG mandates will be, quote, his words, quote, economic roadkill, meaning if they don't do the things that uh, we say they should do, then they don't get any money and they'll die, economic roadkill, as he calls them. Now, it continues to get pushed down, and what a lot of people, and we're talking to mostly a, a U.S.-based American audience today, but this applies to you no matter where, where you're at in the world, but what a lot of people don't understand in the United States is that it also continues working the same way. Our money, you know, starts with the money being used against us, and so you might have heard the word or the, heard of the fund called BlackRock before, and then BlackRock is the largest asset manager in the world. So they have more money, you know, more assets than anybody else. And they are one of the biggest pushers of these ESG mandates. And so they take, uh, basically, they own, between BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street, they basically own every publicly traded company. Go to any of your favorite publicly traded companies, go find out who the shareholders are, and you're going to see one of those three names as the largest shareholder, most likely BlackRock, but then State Street and Vanguard as well. So BlackRock owns almost all the companies out there, all the publicly traded companies. Um, you remember hearing how they were buying up single family homes all across America, pricing single family homes out of uh, single families out of buying homes. And again, pushing ESG mandates. For example, um, they took uh, they took control and interest of Exxon. You might have heard of Exxon before. It's one of the largest um, oil companies, energy companies in the world, uh, American company. They took ownership. They took over the board seats. They ousted some other people from the board. They took over controlling board seats. And then they made Exxon get out of the oil business. Now, it's bad for two reasons. It's bad because they're an oil company. So what does an oil company do when they get out of the oil business? Well, they lose money. And so if you were an investor in that company, you're not real happy about that. You've lost money. Uh, but also, if you're somebody in the world who wants to live, <laughs> you've realized that oil drives the price of everything. And so now the cost of everything that you get went up because we have less oil. Before the break, I was talking about these um, top-down policies that are forcing this, and it all starts with the money. That's why the bankers sit at the top. And they're pushing these policies down through the money. And so now as we get lower, we have asset managers like BlackRock that are forcing these ESG, environmental social governance, mandates through. And um, it's bad. It's scary. Uh, it's creating lots of problems. Um, not just for shareholders, because they bought these companies hoping the shares would go up in value, but it's bad for everybody because, well, in my opinion, and in a lot of other people's opinions, they are working against the best interest of the people they're supposed to represent. So um, as an asset manager, you have something called a fiduciary duty. It means you have a legal, legal obligation to do the best that you can for the shareholders, meaning make them the most money. Uh, but these policies are specifically not doing that. 
And so we're seeing some pushback on this. Uh, oh, if you've been listening to the show every week, um, if you haven't, <laughs> then what are you doing? Don't miss out. <laughs> Take time right now. Set a reminder uh, on your app or whatever on your calendar to join me each and every week at this time, this channel. Um, and if you do miss some of them, don't worry. Don't worry. You can go catch me on the podcast. Just search Mark Moss on your favorite podcast player, iHeart, the iHeart music app or iTunes or whatever. Oh, and you can also watch me and listen to me at the same time on YouTube. Just search Market Disruptors over there. But we've been talking about for the last couple weeks some of these signposts, and one of them was that People are now waking up to what BlackRock is doing, pushing these ESG mandates. And we talked about how Louisiana became the first state to pull their pension funds out. So what a lot of people don't realize is how did BlackRock become the largest asset manager in the world? Where did they get all the money? Well, it's your money. It's your pensions. It's your 401ks that they're managing for you. And then they're using your own money against your best interests. Hmm, that seems like a conflict of interest to me. That doesn't sound like a fiduciary duty, does it? A fiduciary duty is to make, if you're managing my money, you should be making me as much money as you can, not playing politics. Not playing politics at the cost, at, at the tune of costing me money. And that's exactly what Missouri or Louisiana said. Hey, uh, we re you're, you're you're, you're, uh, you've gone woke, you're not honoring your fiduciary duty, um, you're working against our best interests, and we are pulling our money. It was about $800 million, and that's exactly why. And shortly after that, uh, we saw South Carolina follow suit. Um, then uh, Missouri just decided to follow suit. Um, Utah, Arkansas have all followed suit. Um, and basically, they're saying... Uh, Missouri laid a state to divest from BlackRock over ESG initiatives, quote, woke political agenda. They say that BlackRock is prioritizing its woke political agenda above financial interest for consumers. This is per the Missouri State Treasurer Scott Fitzpatrick. Um, so they've pulled their pensions um, from BlackRock. Now, um, like I said, this is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. They say that, uh, quote, this is the right thing to do for Missouri state employees who rely on the asset manager uh, for their retirement. Fiduciary duty must remain the top priority for investment managers, a duty some of them have abdicated in favor of forcing a left-wing social and political agenda that has failed to succeed legislatively on publicly traded companies, end quote. So their words, not mine. So... <laughs> We've, we've, uh, we've given them our money. <laughs> uh, we're hoping that they do the best with our money as they can so we can retire one day. Uh, but they have failed to do that and instead have pushed um, their left-wing social political agenda. That's what they said. Uh, oh, and, and, and I like how he said uh, um, agenda that's failed to succeed legislatively. So what they're saying is uh, these policies have been tried to be forced on us politically, but they've been rejected. The people don't want them. The voters have said, no, we don't want them. So instead of going through the public route where we get to vote and have say, they're now trying to force them upon you with your own money. Let me read it again. He says, the polit political agenda has failed to succeed legislatively. is now being forced on publicly traded companies. So they're taking um, ownership of these publicly traded companies with your money. <laughs> And then doing that, um, he says, goes on, quote, we should not allow asset managers such as BlackRock who have demonstrated that they will prioritize advancing a woke political agenda above the financial interests of their customers to continue speaking on behalf of the state of Missouri, end quote. Uh, again, quote, it is past time that all investors recognize the massive fiduciary breach that is taking place before our eyes and they do something about it, end quote. So look, um, Maybe you don't agree with his statement about uh, a woke um, or left-wing uh, social or political agenda. Maybe you don't agree with that. That's fine. Uh, maybe you like woke left-wing, and that's fine too. Maybe you like right-wing or whatever you want to call it. I, I, I hate to even use these labels. Um, that's fine. Have whatever political ideologies you want. But when it comes to managing my money, all you should be thinking about is my money and doing the best that you can for my money. Let us vote on our politics somewhere else. That's what they're saying. So uh, try to uh, take that part out. Uh, but this is only gaining steam. And so, again, this is a signpost to show that the world is pushing back on this. And so now we saw this week 19 states 
19 states' attorney generals now have formed a coalition to investigate BlackRock. 19 states investigate major U.S. banks pushing ESG policies, quote, killing American companies. Now, remember what I said. Mark Carney said if these companies don't comply, they're going to be, quote, economic roadkill. That's what he said. If companies don't comply with ESG, there'll be economic roadkill. And that's exactly what this says right here. It says they're killing American companies. That's the point. <laughs> you either do what we say or we kill you. And that's exactly what they're saying. So now here it says six major U.S. banks were served with civil investigative demands for information related to ESG implementation. Nineteen Republican-led states are launching an investigation into six large U.S. banks that will examine their involvement in the United Nations Net Zero Banking Alliance, which they say is, quote, killing American companies. So, again, centralization, top down. Whose alliance is this? The United Nations, the UN. The UN has something called Net Zero Banking Alliance. Why are U.S. banks, which is supposed to be a sovereign nation, um, looking out for the interests of its own people? Why are U.S. banks in U.S. states adopting a UN initiative, which is killing American companies? Good question. And that's the question they're trying to find out. Um, and they're, so it says many of the largest banks uh, are being investigated. Bank of America, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan Chase, Morgan Stanley, and Wells Fargo were all served on Wednesday by the states with a civil investigative demand, which is basically a subpoena for requested information. It's a signpost. This is falling apart. It's being pushed back on. A couple more signposts that we see that it's happening. Um, we talked about these, this top-down, this UN control where U.S. banks are adopting these policies of the UN that are killing American businesses. 19 states in the United States have now uh, filed the subpoenas against these banks to find out what they're doing here. Um, but we can also see you know, lots and lots of talk have been uh, going around about the central bank digital currencies, um, and they're a big deal. There should be a lot of talk about them because it is a very big deal. Now, I get it. A lot of people are like, well, but, you know, Mark, uh, all our transactions are digital anyway, right? Uh, we already have cryptocurrencies, right? What's the big deal? Um, well, the reason why it's a big deal is because, yes, they are still digital currencies. So, I mean, technically, I don't really use cash much anymore. I just got back from a vacation down deep down in South South Mexico, and all they want is cash. Uh, nobody does credit cards or debit cards down there. Um, but where I'm here in the United States, it's mostly debit cards and credit cards and wire transfers and, and so forth everywhere. So it's, it's sort of already digital. The difference with a central bank digital currency is that it's programmable money. So they can program it in ahead of time that this person gets this interest rate, this person gets this interest rate, um, this person gets this money, but he can't spend the money on this, 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 right? Things like that. And it is, uh, it's, it's the ultimate tool for surveillance and control, the ultimate tool for surveillance and control, which is why a lot of lawmakers, legislators, and governors in the United States are pushing back on this. But of course, this is a top-down thing. This is what the IMF, International Monetary Fund, once. This is what China, of course, is the first one to roll theirs out. Um, of course, it's China. It complements their social credit score system perfectly. But there's lots of talk of the United States rolling out their own central bank digital currency, or CBDC. And of course, why wouldn't they, right? The dollar is the reserve currency of the entire world. So of course, it makes sense they should roll one out. The difference is that in China, it's communist. Now, uh, I don't understand this, but if I say that, I say it on YouTube, and people say, how could you say that? China's not communist. And it's like, they're literally controlled by the CCP. That's the party that's in power. The communist, Chi the Chinese Communist Party, it literally has it in their name. So I don't get that part. But anyway, of course, uh, in China, they roll it out quickly. It's, it's communist. The United States, we're supposed to be the land of the free. We're supposed to not have things that control us because we're supposed to have freedom. We're also supposed to, supposed to have a say in these types of things. Um, and so there's a lot of pushback going to this. We saw here Fed Governor Waller is skeptical of CBDCs, says he's not a big fan of the Fed issuing a digital dollar. 
And uh, while some people are saying, but but it's just a just like a checking account at the Federal Reserve, right? It's just like that. Um, the problem is, it's not. It's not just that. Um, they went on. He went on to argue that uh, it's just like what the People's Bank of China, the PBOC, has been actively trialing. Um, but now they want to bring it to the U.S. Um, but they understand that this is used for surveillance. Now, they've ro also rolled one out in Nigeria, but it hasn't really been used very much because, well, they don't want to. And they're not quite as communist as, as China has. Uh, but this is a big problem. As a matter of fact, um, back to the IMF, International Monetary Fund. Remember, we started out at the beginning of the show, if you're with me, talking about the world as an org chart. And at the top sits the BIS, or the IMF, International Monetary Fund. And uh, this week, we saw the central bank, uh, uh, something came out from the IMF that says, uh, central bank digital currencies would let governments control what people spend money on per the IMF official. Hmm. It says, uh, International Monetary Fund said that the central bank digital currency, CBDC, could potentially allow government to control what people spend their hard-earned cash on. That doesn't sound like freedom, does it? So they can control what I'm able to spend my money on. Hmm. Sounds like surveillance. Sounds like kind of the opposite of freedom to me. Uh, which is why... Americans don't want this. Um, Neil Kasharki, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, said in writing, quote, I can see how China is for this. I don't see how Americans would want this. So that's the Federal Reserve uh, president of Minneapolis. He went on to uh, say that the governments have a historical pattern of misusing these tools, citing Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's move to freeze the bank accounts of, uh, of the trucker protesters. Yeah, doesn't sound like a good thing. Now, remember, the top of the pyramid, top of the org chart was the BIS and the IMF. Now, a May report from the BIS found that 90% of national central banks are planning to launch their own CBDC for release to the general public. That includes the United States. Now, we know that Biden has put through his, uh, his mandates, his executive orders, to rush this through. So this is being mandated. This is being an, this is an executive order by the Biden administration to rush this through. Now, Augustin Karstens, he's the, he's the head of the BIS, noted in 2021 that central banks would have, quote, absolute control over the rules and regulations that will determine the use of that expressed or that expression of central bank liability. And then we'll also have the technology to enforce that, end quote. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's directly out of his mouth. Central bank CBDCs will have, quote, absolute control. And have the technology to enforce it. Again, like the head of the Federal Reserve of Minneapolis, Kasharsky said, I can see how China wants this. I don't see how Americans would want this. And they don't. I don't want it. You shouldn't want it. I can't see how anybody would want that. And so... What do we do about that? That's the question. Let's dig into that now. So what do we do about this? So we can see the signposts, other signposts that we have. We can see, um, you know, throughout the world, we saw OPEC, um, which is where we get the, our, our oil from the Middle East. And the U.S. has, uh, you know, did a deal with, with Saudi Arabia back in the 70s to have what's called the petrodollar. Um, and that kind of controls the oil flow and maintains the dollars um, staying in the world. That's all falling apart. Um we have, you know, from the financial side, the sovereign sovereign debt bubble is is bursting right now. Uh, but let's just focus on this right now. So, what can we do about this? As uh, Kasharsky said, I don't see anybody why anybody in the U.S. would want it. I don't want it. You don't want it. Um, I don't want uh, my pension money being weaponized against me. I want my pension money to grow and be as safe as it can, so I can retire. I don't want it working against my best interests, like pushing the price of oil go oil up so that my gasoline goes up, everything goes up. I don't want that. I want those types of social issues to be voted on, right? I thought this was a democracy. All you hear is, we have to protect the democracy, to protect the democracy. That's all we hear. So we should be able to vote on it, right? But what if our vote doesn't count? And that's the key piece. 
That's that's the linchpin of it all. Now, I'm not going to get into, you know, whatever happened in the last election, but I think it's pretty obvious to most everybody that our votes count less and less and less. And really, that's a problem with a democracy. Democracy is really tyranny of the minority by the majority. If 10 of us all got together and uh, seven of us voted that the th three of you, the minority, should just give us all your money, well, that's democracy. Tyranny of the majority by the minority. But there's a better way. There's a better way, which is what CBDCs are against, but there's a way that we can push back and it gives us a massive opportunity at the same time. The centralization is being rejected. We can see that the IMF and the BIS's plan to um, change us, not through democ democratically elected political processes, but through financial processes like BlackRock, how that's being pushed back on. We can see that the people are rejecting this. Uh, we can see <clears throat> things like the central bank digital currencies that are being pushed through in China. But as uh, the Minneapolis Federal Reserve Board president said, we can see why China wants it, but I don't understand why anybody in the United States would want it. And of course we don't. But the problem is they're trying to push this on us anyway. Biden administration is pushing this through through executive order. That means basically he's the dictator and we do what he says. That's, an, that's what an executive order is, meaning we don't vote on it. You get no say. I get no say. Um, all our elected leaders that we elected, they get no say. He, as the dictator, he pushes it through. So what do we do about this? We don't even get a chance to vote. So the real vote comes not through the political process of going and casting a ballot. The real vote comes with our money. That's where our vote comes. So look at this. Look what this is exactly what I talked about with BlackRock. So they couldn't push these policies, these ESG policies through the political process. So they're pushing them through the financial process, which is using your money to take over these companies and force their will. But it's our money. So why are we allowing them to have our money to push policies we don't want? Why don't we use our money to push the policies we do want? That's what we need to do if we want to voice our opinion. We vote with our money. We can also vote with our feet. So we see that um, I, think, I, I think it was uh, New York has the highest amount of people leaving the state. They're voting with their feet. I don't like the heavy-handed lockdowns that you've had. I don't like the heavy-handed tax regulations that you have. So I'm leaving, right? They're, vo they're, vo they're voting with their feet. We can also vote with our money, and it's happening like crazy. As a matter of fact, um, since Netflix went woke, quote-unquote woke, they, um, their stock is down massive into double digits. Um, Meta, Facebook, Meta, they're down into mat 75% their stock is down. So they're saying like, uh, go woke, go broke, right? We saw uh, CNN try to launch their new, uh, their, their ratings have crashed so hard. They tried to launch a digital streaming platform, lost over $300 million doing that. And so people are voting with their money, which is the really only the vote that counts, which is why as these states are pulling their money from BlackRock, BlackRock is all of a sudden forced to reconsider their policies. As a matter of fact, they put out a press release saying just that. They said, wait, 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 hang on, hang on. We're not as evil as you think we are. They're being forced to change, not through a political process, through a financial process. Now, central bank digital currencies could change all that. Central bank digital currencies could say, well, you can only give your money to these companies that follow along with these left-wing woke ideologies. You can't give it to competitors. That's the problem. We need to push back on that. So how can we do that? Well, there's a couple ways that we can do that. So uh, one of the best examples is uh, Ben Shapiro over the Daily Wire. His show was sponsored by a company called Harry's Razors. Now, Ben Shapiro, he's, uh, he's known for saying lots of m super mean, hateful things. And on his radio show, he said that um, men can't get pregnant. And uh, <laughs> I'm saying that sarcastically, of course. Uh, and so that was so mean and hateful that his sponsor, Harry's Razors, went and said, hey, Ben Shapiro, that was very mean and hateful, and you need to issue a formal apology. And if you don't, we're going to pull our sponsorship away. And he said, you know what? 
I'm not going to issue a sponsor. Uh, I'm not going to issue a policy. And as a matter of fact, you can take your sponsorship with you. And I'm going to c- uh, create a competitor called Jeremy's Razors. And we are going to just do the same thing you're doing, but you're going to push your woke ideology. We're going to post a, post a I'm going to call it a, I don't want to call it an anti-woke. I'm going to call it just a common sense policy. And they're crushing it. Why? Because average people that are the majority, what, what might be called the silent majority in this country, in the United States, they don't really align with that. And if they were given a choice of two companies, one that's pushing ideologies they don't want, and one that's pushing ideologies they do want, they're going to give their money to the one that aligns with them. Now today, it's very easy to find companies that are pushing woke ideologies. But can you find companies that aren't? Well, we already talked about BlackRock. There's a new asset management company that started up called Strive Asset Management. And they're purposely pushing non-woke ideologies. So you can pull your money out of BlackRock, you can give it to them. Now, we know T-Mobile is very vocal and outspoken about pushing their very uh, heavy-handed left-wing ideologies. But where are you going to go? AT&T? Are they any better? Well, now there's a new phone company called My Patriot Mobile that's popped up. And now, as a consumer, I have a choice. I can take my money from this company and give it to this I can vote with my money. We have conservative dating apps that are popping up. Of course, we know about the success of Black Rifle Coffee, very strong in pushing, you know, second amendment rights. And they went public to massive success. We have my pillow, you know, we have countless examples of this. So, what is the um, opportunity here? The opportunity is you could literally go take any company and position it properly to this silent majority audience, just like Jeremy's Razors did, and you can crush it. Now, it might be very hard to move into a, a, a market that's already dominated with existing companies like a razor company. Like, how are you going to go compete against uh, Gillette and, and all these companies? But they did it by serving the needs and ideologies of a group of people that allow them to vote with their money. We can see opportunities like this all over the place. As a matter of fact, uh, and, we, and we can see how much of a need there is for this. If you, if you look at a map, um, you could just search this um, like a, uh, a map of the 2020 um, election, uh, red versus blue. And if you look at a picture of the United States, you'll see that the red dominates probably about 80% of the map, and the blue operates about, you know, maybe takes up about 15, 20% of the map. Um, Now, the blue takes the most heavily concentrated areas, so, you know, it kind of skews a little bit. But all of that, that shows you your potential market. It's big. And we can see the rise of this happening very, very, very fast uh, through politics. But again, where do people put their money? I like to use a quote from Socrates. He says that the secret to change is to focus all your energy not on fighting the old, but on building the new. And so all over the news today, I see people fighting against the education system. They're not happy with what their kids are learning in school. Great. Start your own. Create a homeschool pod. Create new curriculum. New stuff for kids, right? You don't like the way mainstream media is censoring you. Great. Start your own media outlets. Create your own media apps. Look at Rumble. They just went public. They crushed it. Um, you're not happy with uh, what's happening with your money. Great. Pull your money out. Manage it on your own. Or give it to a company like Strive. You're not happy with the medical system and what they're pushing on you. Great. Go go start your own medical practice or support people who have done that. That's the opportunity, and that's how we change the world. We change the mo- world um, not on fighting the old, but on building the new, voting with your money. Now, Bitcoin underpins all of that because with the central bank digital currency, they're going to control where you can spend your money. So they're going to say, well, you can only give it to companies that align with us. You can't give it to companies that don't align with us. Without the freedom of payments, there is no freedom at all. And so Bitcoin underpins all this. So while you're at it, make sure to buy some Bitcoin as well. That's it. You're listening to The Mark Moss Show. Hopefully you enjoyed today's show. That's what I got. Thanks for listening.